Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring anomalistic psychology. My guest, Professor Stanley Krippner, is the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. He is the author of over a thousand academic papers in the field of psychology, parapsychology, and related areas. In addition to that, he is the past president of several psychological organizations and the recipient of lifetime career awards from several as well. He is the co-editor of an important book published by the American Psychological Association called Varieties of Anomalous Experience, as well as many other books. Welcome, Stan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I love this category of anomalous experience because it seems as if human beings are capable of uh, having a wide variety, a whole spectrum of experiences that don't fit easily into conventional categories. Well, you're absolutely right. And when you say conventional categories, we're talking about mainstream psychology, which is my discipline and which is the discipline from which our book, Varieties of Anomalous Experience, is written. Now, you can define psychology very easily as the scientific study of behavior and experience. And there are experiences that more or less fall outside of conventional psychological investigation. So my co-editors, Stephen Lynn, Etzel Cardenia, and I, thought it was time to pull together this type of experience, but looking at it from a psychological and a scientific perspective. Now, there have been some other attempts over the years to do this, and they were good attempts, but nothing really as comprehensive as our attempt that really looked into the scientific data that exists. And, and the interesting thing is that uh, this is amongst the most popular books offered by the American Psychological Association. Much to everybody's surprise, this book became a bestseller. Yeah. And not only that, but recently they said it's time to update the book. So we had all the chapter authors update their chapters, and we updated our introductions, and so now we have a brand new Varieties mm -hmm. of Anomalous Experience. The second edition. Yes, yeah, second edition. Yeah. So what we're talking about are things like out-of-body experience, near-death experience, UFO abduction experience, uh, shamanistic, uh, otherworldly travels, astral travel, for example, yes. and, and quite a few others. Yes, because when we use the word anomalous in our book, that covers two different types of experiences. Experiences that are rare, such as the alien abduction experience, or unexplained, like psi-related experiences, which are very common, but which are unexplained. Mm -hmm. And of course, some are both. Mm -hmm. Some are both. Out-of-body experiences are not that uncommon, but they're not satisfactorily explained. So that's the ballpark. Yeah. And we have, for example, synesthetic experiences. Synesthesia is a crossing of the senses, or you hear colors, or you taste smells. That's pretty rare, but that's also unexplained. So we pull together the scientific data and propose several different psychological models 
that are attempting to explain experiences like that. Mm -hmm. It's not as if you're saying we must accept a paranormal interpretation or we must accept a skeptical interpretation. It's, it's more as if you're saying these are puzzling experiences and here are half a dozen different explanations for each one of them that have appeared in the literature. Yes, exactly. We present what scientific data exists and then we propose some possible psychological explanations, and the three of us are, shall we say, somewhat skeptical about some of these experiences, but you see, we label these as experiences, not as events, mm -hmm. and in experience is the phenomenology that somebody has about some puzzling experience, like traveling out of the body. Now, if we were to pin down and say, yes, this person actually was out of the body because we can take a photograph of the so-called astral body and there's a consensus among scientists that that actually is an out-of-body uh, astral projection, then okay, now that's an event. There's consensus on it. Yeah. No, sad to say, with a few exceptions, all of the experiences that we're talking about are really experiences that haven't quite cut the bait to be an event. Well, of course, as a parapsychologist, we could cite, uh, and I know you do cite, dozens and dozens of, of studies that show that there is, let's call it a veridical component a verifiable, measurable component associated with many such experiences, like out-of-body experiences. Of course, and this is where subjectivity comes in. You and I would say that this is an event, but mainstream psychology would say, no, this is still regulated to experience, doesn't pass the muster for us to call it an event. Well, the important thing I would think, Stan, is that by uh, writing this book and making it so widely available as it is to the psychological community in the United States, you're creating permission for people at least to talk about these things that are otherwise taboo topics. Well, you're right. This has been one of my missions for most of my life, all of my scientific life, is to sort of liberate people from pathologizing their experiences and also to take these experiences and bring them into the rubric of psychology. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that any of these experiences can be studied scientifically. Maybe not completely like mystical experiences, but at least partially we can study mystical experiences from a psychological perspective. And so, as long as we can say this is grist for the psychological mill, this is something that we can measure, that we can observe, that we can understand to mm -hmm. some extent. And also, people no longer have to hide these experiences and say, oh, I don't dare tell people that I had that experience. People would think I was crazy. I remember years ago, I knew a young woman who regularly went out of her body and she didn't tell anybody and finally, she started to tell her parents, and they, oh, that's, you know, childish fantasy. One night, there was a fire down the road, and her parents didn't want her to go to the fire because they thought it would be too scary an experience for her. But she was a curious young woman, and so she went out of the body to the fire. And her parents came back from the fire, and their daughter gave her a specific description of what was burned down, what fire trucks arrived, what the survivors had to say, and that everybody would say specific details. The parents were shocked and they said, don't you dare tell anybody about that again, they'll think you're crazy. Yeah, well, I'm sure you and I and probably everybody who's involved in the field of parapsychology has had this experience virtually every time we ever give a public talk. Somebody comes up and says, I want to share my experience with you. You know, I've never told anybody else before. Yes. Yes, that's very sad. I hear that time to time. I've never told anybody before. And there's probably good reasons. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article about Steve Lipscomb, who was a family man, a Sunday school teacher, and one night he had a dream 
about a murder down the road, and indeed he woke up in the morning and some young Filipino nurses had been murdered in their blood, in cold blood in their oh, bed. Oh and so, of course, he went to the police thinking maybe some of the details would be helpful in arresting the murderer. He gave specific information, and the police decided he must have been the murderer and was talking about this from a guilty conscience. They put him in jail, and the jury convicted him. Oh. And then he appealed in the retrial. They cited some of my work on dream clairvoyance, that you can dream about something that happens, mm -hmm. And after, I think, maybe over a year in jail, he was released. So I wrote an article about this case, and I titled it, You Have a Clairvoyant Dream, Be Careful Who You Tell. As a matter of fact, I've heard of professional psychics who, when they come to the police with accurate information about a crime, uh, who have been arrested, uh, Eventually, charges were dropped in those mm -hmm. cases because they were able to establish more clearly, being a professional psychic, how they came upon that information. Well, there you are. You see, that's one of the reasons we wrote the book. And mm -hmm. so even though the charges are dropped in these cases, it costs money for the person to yeah. get a lawyer. It's agony. It causes distress on their family. and. In many other cultures of the world, some of the indigenous cultures that I visited, this would just be taken and destroyed. Well, of course, you had a hunch, a precognitive or a clairvoyant or a telepathic dream or an out-of-body experience. Yes, and so you are giving us details that are very helpful in apprehending the criminal. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk for a minute about what I regard as uh, one of the most puzzling of all anomalous experiences, and, and these are the cases of uh, UFO abduction yes. claims. I know that it's very controversial. There are even some researchers who think we, we have to take this seriously. These mm -hmm. people are really being abducted, but that's certainly a minority opinion. Yes, it is. This is probably the major shall we say, outlier in our book. Mm -hmm. But these experiences are reported so often that we thought that deserved a chapter. There are probably at least a thousand such claimants. Of course, right. Uh, I have to admit that I'm very skeptical about these experiences. And one of my students did a dissertation on this, and she interviewed some people who had been abducted. And she found that in most of the cases, these are people who were suffering from childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. Some adult had traumatized them as a child. And so this took on what is called a mask quality, the mask being the abduction experience, which is a mask for the trauma mm -hmm. and the molestation. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that could be one possible psychological explanation for an alien abduction yeah. experience. But there are others. Before we go to sleep at night, many people enter into what is called a hypnagogic state, mm -hmm. where they have fantasies, and some of these alien abduction experiences could be hypnagogic images. Mm -hmm. There are others, too. Uh, especially what we call fantasy-prone people who cannot separate imagination from consensual reality. After presenting all of these psychological experiences, we say, now, on the other hand, maybe some of these people actually have been abducted. So we leave the door open for people who want to accept this literally. So that's a good example of what mm -hmm. we have done in this book and sort of the approach that I take when I hear some of these pretty wild anomalous experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, um, not long ago, I had the opportunity to interview a colleague of ours, Dr. Vernon Nepi, who has done a lot of work with and what he calls subjective psychic experiences. It's a good term, yes. And he uh, found a strong correlation between uh, people who report many subjective paranormal experiences and people who have um, volatile temporal lobe activity in the brain yes. by other independent measures. Yes. 
Well, Dr. Nepi is, I think, one of the most brilliant people who you have interviewed. I have a high regard for his ability. And he actually is a neurologist, among other things, and so he has the data. Of course, brain disturbances can create hallucinations mm -hmm. and anomalous experiences. And they can also make somebody prone to anomalous experiences. Some shamans uh, have histories of epilepsy, for example. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that their experiences are not also events, but it means they're prone to something like this. Mm -hmm. The temporal lobe is extremely important because this is where a lot of our experiential data is processed and where a story is made out of uh, what otherwise could be just some random images. Mm -hmm. So if there is a disturbance in the temporal lobe of the brain, you can get all sorts of wild accounts of unusual mm -hmm. experiences. Uh, and I understand uh, and have interviewed people about the fact that uh, another correlation with people who report anomalous experiences is, as you indicated earlier, childhood trauma. Yes, yes. Uh, the intriguing thing is that you might have a, an active temporal lobe of your brain or you might have been traumatized as a child. That would lead a psychologically trained practitioner to come up with a psychodynamic theory of why you've had this anomalous experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that psychodynamic theory could, could have some validity, but on the other hand, it doesn't rule out the uh, possibility that, uh, as you call it, an actual event took place. Yes, it could be that, again, this is a predisposing factor. Mm -hmm. Or, again, traumatic experiences have their effect on the brain, especially what we call the amygdala and the hippocampus areas, the limbic system of the brain, yes, highly right. emotional. People who are traumatized have excess activity in those parts of the brain. And if there is a link between the limbic system and the frontal lobe, you can make a story out of these experiences and this becomes an alien abduction experience or something else. Very often that link is not made and so the person goes through their life traumatized to mm -hmm. a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And these emotions come out in nightmares or in personality quirks like being short-tempered or mm -hmm. antisocial or shyness or being withdrawn. It's really very sad to realize the surprisingly large number of children who are traumatized sexually, physically, emotionally, largely by members of their family. Mm -hmm. It's very, very sad mm -hmm. because this leaves a scar and sometimes it never gets resolved mm -hmm. and at other times it gets translated into an anomalous experience. You know, my own thinking about this is that when a innocent child has been traumatized that way, and the external world around them, the normal world of the senses, is no longer a safe place for them, and so they retreat into a world of, of their own. And I suspect that that kind of an inner retreat can sort of push open doors to uh, actual uh, psi experiences. Well, I think you're absolutely right. When children are traumatized, it's usually not by a stranger. It's by a member of the clergy, as we well know from the movie Spotlight. And <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've known this for decades. I've talked with friends of mine who have been traumatized sexually by priests and ministers and other members of the clergy, but also by members of the family. Mm -hmm. If not a father or mother, thank heavens, maybe by a distant relative, a cousin, an uncle, an aunt. Mm -hmm. Boys can be traumatized as well as girls, as you well know, or by an authority figure. I have one of my students, she was sexually molested by a very distinguished politician. And this never came to light, for better or for worse, but this was an authority figure. So when he said he wanted to have sex with her, well, she was in such awe of him because of his power that, of course, she agreed. Later, she regretted it and developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I've heard estimates that if we look at childhood trauma in the broadest sense, including maybe the loss of a sibling or having a sibling who is mentally ill, that we're talking about nearly 50% of the population. It's an astonishingly high number. The good news is that a minority of these turn into something what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. However, PTSD comes on a spectrum. One can have trauma and the effects of trauma without developing a disorder because of this spectrum. But a trauma does leave its mark on most people. Mm -hmm. And in terms of our topic, one of those marks is to make this person vulnerable, for better or for worse, to an anomalous experience. So many of these people, in a sense, they're special on one hand. They may be having authentic out-of-body experiences, uh, authentic um, a wide variety of clairvoyant and other types of paranormal or mediumistic or shamanistic or healing talents and experiences. And on the other hand, they're also wounded. You're absolutely right. Now, again, so that your listeners know that not all anomalous experiences are triggered by trauma, yeah. I'll tell you what we studied in our dream laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center. Mm -hmm. We had a medical student who volunteered for an experiment because he had gone through the training program from the Rosicrucian group. Oh, yes. This is an, an esoteric school, as you well know, that yeah. allegedly goes back to the time of the Egyptians. But they have some very interesting philosophies and some very interesting techniques to give people out-of-body experiences. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to see if he could go out of his body during a... Uh, dream study. Mm -hmm. This way we would measure the brain waves. Mm -hmm. So he was a medical student. He was very curious. So there had been a previous study by Charles Tart where a woman came in and allegedly went out of her body and read a several digit number on a shelf above her bed. That he had placed there as an ESP target. That's right. Mm -hmm. And in his write-up Charles Tart noted several shortcomings of the study, pretty far-fetched, like a mirror that she pulled out of her nightgown and reached up to read the number, very far-fetched, but mm -hmm. he was honest, he wanted to give all possibilities. Yep. We ruled out every one of those, so this was an airtight experiment. The first night, we randomly selected a picture, and it was in an envelope and so I took the envelope and went to the shelf we had built above the bed, unfastened the envelope and dropped the picture into the shelf, not knowing what the picture was. Mm -hmm. Okay. That night he had some very, very vivid dreams, not about the picture. Second night, same thing, vivid dreams, not about the picture. Third night, very vivid dreams, not about the picture. Fourth night, we noted some strange markings on his electroencephalograph because in our dream studies, we measure people's brain waves as well as rapid eye movements. Mm -hmm. Very slow alpha, which you do not get during rapid eye movement sleep. And then a voice came, I've just come back from having an out-of-body experience. The picture is a picture of a sunset. I see you had an audio monitor. Yeah, we always have audio monitors in our studies. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't know what the picture was, but after the night was over, we retrieved the picture, a picture called Memories of a Perfect Sunset by an obscure artist. There was the sunset, and we went to the repository of dreams by Hall and Van de Castle, which is a standard way of measuring dream content. Mm -hmm. People dream about sunsets one out of several thousand times. Uh -huh. So there was our very ridical demonstration of an out-of-body experience. That's mm -hmm. the good news. Yeah. The bad news is he had to go back to medical school, so he didn't hang around for repeat experiments. Mm -hmm. Well, the intriguing thing to me about this story is that he had gone through the Rosicrucian training.
program. I think probably there are at least 100,000 people who have been through that program, and there must be, I'm going to say off the top of my head, as many as 1,000 other uh, religious denominations and esoteric societies and organizations and even small cults of one type or another that are offering this type of training or something similar so yes. that that really it's not unrealistic to think that here in North America there would be a few million people who have had training experiences of that type. Oh yes. Waldo Vieira is a Brazilian mm -hmm. uh, who I've met and I've seen his oh, school. Yes. Project he has huge classes learning how to go out of the body. Yeah. And of course his position is they do this for their spiritual development mm -hmm. because they're able to raise their consciousness. And you know, I've talked to some of his students. Oh yes, they swear they've been able to go out of their body. So this now is becoming a more common experience than it was 20, 30 years ago. People are talking about it. That's uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was an undergraduate studying at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, we were meeting with the uh, Help Form, the Psychology Student Association, and one of the, my fellow students raised his hand and said, we ought to study astral projection. And <laughs> I thought, I thought this kid is crazy. Uh, but I must admit, I've gone through some enormous changes myself since <laughs> since then. Now, astral projection. This is the old world. The old word for out of body yeah. experience or OBEs. Now, this is mainstream. This mm -hmm. is being studied by conventional psychologists, by neurologists. They don't, you know go along with the astral projection model, but at least they're studying this and they're finding out what parts of the brain are involved. And so, like so many other anomalous experiences, this is now being put, mm -hmm. taken seriously and put into some experimental framework. Well, Stanley Krippner, you deserve a lot of credit for helping to bring topics like this into the mainstream. Thank you so much for being with me. You are so welcome. And thank you for being with us.